Okay, it's 1010. Um, welcome everyone to this conversation. Um, I'm okay. Andrea Abrams. I'm Andrea Abrams. I am the Chief Diversity Officer at Center College and I will be your host for this morning. I thank everyone for uh, doing this bright and early on a Saturday at 10 o'clock. I don't know about y'all, but I had a little trouble getting out of bed. It was watching the news late last night. Um, so tonight, or not tonight, today, what we're gonna do is discuss being black in Kentucky. And you've been invited here because um, you, uh, JH has selected you as people who have some important stories and memories about places um, that black people have gathered. We're talking about churches, school, social clubs, restaurants, business, uh, uh, barber shops, other businesses. And we want to get your stories and your memories of these places. Amongst us today, uh, in addition to you, there are some artists who are going to listen to these stories and then create art based on the stories and the memories that you tell. So the format for this morning is that we'll have everyone introduce themselves. I'll go over um, a consent form for your informed consent. We'll set some ground rules for the discussion and then we'll just get into it, okay? So I wanna start now with letting the members of the committee who have helped pull this together introduce themselves. And I'll start with Nikki Kincaid. Hello, I'm Nikki Kincaid. I'm the Executive Director at Art Center of the Bluegrass. And uh, we thank you very much for being here. I know this is, um, like Andrea said, a little early in the morning. And we are here to listen. And we are very excited to bring our community together in the winter um, with this exhibit and other exhibits that will highlight what it's like to be Black here in Kentucky. And thank you. We appreciate your time. Um, Amy Frederick. Hi, I'm Amy. Uh, I teach art history at Center College and uh, I'm a member of the advisory committee for the exhibition and I look forward um, to listening and I look forward to the exhibition next winter. Thank you. Lisa? You're on mute. <laughs> Hello, I'm Lisa Williams. I um, teach creative writing at Center and English, and uh, I'm also a member of the advisory committee for this um, exhibition and just really look forward to listening and, um, and seeing the exhibition as well. Brandon? I'm Brandon Long. I'm the uh, visual arts director at the Art Center of the Bluegrass, and uh, I'm also excited about this uh, show coming up. We've got a lot of great things happening. Uh, Excited that you guys could join us this morning. Kate? Good morning. I'm Kate Snyder. I'm the Associate Director here at Art Center of the Bluegrass, and one of my big jobs is marketing. So I will get to tell everyone about this wonderful exhibit when it comes together. So thanks for being here. Mm. Cheryl? Did you say Cheryl, Andrea? I did. Okay. Hi, this is Cheryl Burton. Um, I'm a nurse at Center College and a part of this awesome experience with the Art Center. J.H.? I'm J.H. Atkins, a retired uh, educator and was introduced yesterday as a lifetime, long-time community activist. So I'm going to take that on as a new title. <laughs> Thank you. All right, and so now I'd like to introduce the two artists that we have joining us. Let's we'll start with you, Sandra. Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Sandra Charles, and uh, I'm an oil painter, and my work focuses on uh, the issues that um, African Americans face here in our society. Mm -hmm. And I'm really looking forward to uh, working on this project. I've gotten great ideas, and I love learning about Danville. Thank you, Sandra. LaVon? Yeah, hi. I'm LaVon Williams, an artist um, in Lexington, Kentucky, and I'm really excited about this uh, project. It sounds great, and I'm doing a project on the east end of Lexington, Kentucky, so I think it all tie in. Thank you. 
All right, so before we get to the introduction of the participants, I wanted to um, go over the rule, the informed consent to make sure we're all on the same page with that. So you're being asked to participate in a community conversation hosted by the Art Center of the Bluegrass. The purpose of this conversation is to hear your thoughts, memories, and experiences of being Black in Danville. The content of that conversation will be used in the creation of an art exhibit that will be on display at the Art Center of the Bluegrass, both physically and online, from January through March 2021. As a participant in this project, you are taking part in this Zoom meeting with the facilitator and other community members. As you know, one of our artists are in participating in the Zoom and this meeting is being recorded. The recording may be shared with, other, with the artists and the public as part of this exhibit. Both your words and your likeness may be visible to the public. As a participant in this project, there are no foreseeable physical or emotional risks or discomforts to you. If you should at any time feel that your participation would subject you to either physical or emotional risk or discomfort, you are free to remove yourself from the project. There may be no potential benefit to you for participating in this project other than a sense of satisfaction that you have contributed to a better understanding of the Black experience in Danville. There will be no cost to you for participating. Your participation is voluntary. You may withdraw at any time. Your name will be published within the context of the exhibit as a participant in the recorded conversation. So at this point, will you please raise your hand if you agree to participate in the conversation under these conditions? All right, thank you. So I'd like to let everyone get a chance to introduce themselves and with what you could do if you um, would tell us your name and how long you have lived in Danville. And I'll start with Mrs. Lincoln, Lakin. This is Martha Gray. Martha Gray, okay. Yes. Uh, I, this is my home. I've lived here all my life. Uh, I was married and lived in Lexington just for a little while and then I come back to Danville, but I, this is my home. And I, am, I was born uh, in, in 27, 1927, October the 15th, and uh, I soon have be 93 years old, so I've been well, here quite a while. I got a lot to do. <laughs> right, thank you. Um, the Tillmans. I'm Ennis Tillman. This is my wife, Linda Tillman. We've been here for 44 years. And I'm a retired engineer from Panasonic after 42 years. And I'm retired from Ephraim McDowell after 35 years. Ah, thank you. Ms. Stallworth? You're on mute. There you go. You're almost connected. Well, Mrs. Stallworth, while you're connecting, I'm gonna let, um, Mrs. Atkins, introduce herself. I'm Artie Atkins, and um, I've lived here in Danville since 1970. Well, I came here first in 72 and left for a couple of years and then came back in 74. We've been here ever since. And um, I was a student at Kentucky State University when I moved here and uh, work, kept working on my, my degree. Uh, and then finally got a job in the Danville schools. So I'm a retired educator. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Stallworth, looks like you're ready. You're, you're on mute again.
Does anyone have any suggestions to help Ms. Stallworth? Brandon? As the host, can you unmute her? If you sort of okay. mouse over her um, image, you might be able to do that for her. Okay. If you look in the bottom left corner, there should be a little microphone. Mm -hmm. And then if you click on that, Ms. Stallworth, that might, if you can find that, that might help you unmute. Yeah. My button's not letting me. Yeah, me, I, I'm not able to unmute as well. Yeah. Ms. Stallworth, it might help maybe if you hung up and called back in. Jage, are you there? J.H.? Yes, ma'am. Could you, yes, could you reach out to Mrs. Stallworth and kind of help her offline for us? I will. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm on the line. I'm on the phone with Billy Richards and his wife right now. When I get off of them and tell her, I'll call Miss Tilly. Okay. All right. Thank All right. You. All right. So Ms. Stallworth, um, J.H. is going to uh, connect with you in a few minutes to help you with your, um, with uh, your microphone. All right. So let's get started with some of the questions. Um, so most of you, I think, um, can you raise your hand if you went to school here in Danville? Yeah, only Mrs. Lakin, okay. So let's start with this one. What I would like you to do is to think back on over the course of Danville's history in your time here in Danville about the black spaces that have meant a lot to you. Things like restaurants, barbershops, social clubs, stores. What, is your, what are your favorite memories or stories about these places? If you could tell us like one really good memory or one good, really good story about one of those places where, it was, where black people gathered and it was a black space. Um, that would we, that'd be a good way for us to start off. How about you, Mr. Tillman? Well, oh, uh, Second Street. Okay. They had uh, our restaurants there, and they uh, we could go there as a teenager. And certain ones of them, the ones they sold beer and stuff in, we wasn't allowed in there. But we could go to the others. And it's one thing I can say about the men and, and things of, of Danville. They would go to the fields and wherever they worked at and wore their jeans and overalls. But when they come to Second Street, they would always be dressed. You never seen nobody with, a, with, with overalls or jeans on. They was always dressed. And we could go there, but they were real strict with us. What do you mean they were strict with you? Well, you could go and, and, and have a good time, but they didn't allow teenagers to have anything, alcohol, and you couldn't smoke. Of course, you know, you're going to slip and do those little things and get caught. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know sometimes we would stop by there and be in the restaurant and Somebody say, oh, here come Reverend Carter or something. Somebody have a cigarette in the hand, they go underneath the table with it to keep him from seeing us. But, you know, you, you did things. We did things like the kids do now, but not as bad. 
I, and when everybody corrected everybody's children. If, the, if, if somebody seen you doing something and they said something to you, you better do what they tell you because they don't. They're going to tell your parents on you. Okay. And then you would be grounded and you'd be everything. <laughs> Thank you. How about uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tillman? What are your memories or stories? You're on mute. I'm sorry. We arrived here in 1976. And at that time, I don't recall that many black businesses, but my experience was really, I'm an athlete and they would, well, she said former, <laughs> well, okay, former <laughs> athlete. <laughs> but anyway, my experience was with the Bakewood Home Park is like every weekend, whether it was Saturday or Sunday after church, there was always uh, some competitive sports going on, basketball or softball at Bakewood Home. And that's basically how I got to meet most of the people here in Dampo on the athletic field. Okay. Thank you. How about you, Mrs. Tillman? Well, when he played ball, I was usually there to support. So I got to meet a lot of people also. So as he said, there were not any black businesses when we arrived uh, other than beauty shops. And of course, you know, there were always black beauty shops around. And uh, the first lady that did my hair when I moved here, uh, she's now passing on Miss Madeline Summers. And uh, I'm sure Ms. Ms. Adam will tell you more about uh, her husband, which was the principal of, I think it was Bate. But we always, uh, she was like a confidant to me. And so she became like my, my mentor here in Danville. Well, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about people for a minute, because that's what really makes up a community. And every community has those people that everybody knows, right? The leaders, the helpers, the movers and shakers, the troublemakers, the change makers, those, those people who you're, were your mentors. Can um, you tell, can you, is it, would you be help, um, comfortable sharing stories? Or let me put it this way, who are the people that should be remembered? Who are the really, those, those people from Danville's black community that did have an impact on your life and were important parts of Danville's history? Who hasn't spoken? Um, Mrs. Gray, who, who do you think is important? Well, I'll tell you, uh, where I live in Danville, well, uh, I live for, in a neighborhood with some very important black people. Okay. There was uh, Miss Maggie Jones, she was a school teacher, and she lived on First Street. And that's the first time, that's where she lived there before she moved to Wilmers Road. And then next door to her, was uh, Mr. Craig Tolliver, which he run a, a liquor store. And then next door to him, and they own these homes. Next door to him was Mr. Bunk Brum and his wife. And I don't know whether they uh, owned the house next door to there or not. Then he had another place on the other side of the street was a big barn, like where he may have had a farm or something like that. But they were business people, black business people, and owned a lot of property and land in them. Now, they was our neighbors where we lived at. Because where we lived at, we lived in a white neighborhood, really. I was raised there. What was it like living in a white neighborhood? It was wonderful. Okay. I didn't, I, we didn't, uh, the Jack Stiff, the Mayor Stiff, grandfather and uh, Jim Clay uh, he's a lawyer uh, his family they lived there and Miss um, uh, Miss Cheek Miss Cheek those are rich white people and they lived on Lexington Street we was in the alley between Lexington and Broadway mm -hmm. and but we never had no problems 
with anybody. And when we were coming up, and we would all get with them, and we'd go to the main street, and we'd I, I always had sat on the stools and everything, and nobody never said anything to me. I never was. Nobody said anything about it. Okay. Thank you. So, I mean, that's the part of the town, a town uh, that I lived in. Mm -hmm. And now I, I'm not saying that everybody in black and them could go in there and sit on them student things because we would just be with certain people and then we did it. We just, just way we was raised up. Okay. Thank you. How about the Tillmans? We bought our first house in 1979, and it was in a predominantly white neighborhood. Uh, we had an incident which we got the police involved just to make them aware, but I came out of my driveway uh, and there was two trees in the front of our yard. And what happened was, when I came out, they were wrapped in tissue paper, white tissue paper. Uh, that was the first incident that we had. And of course, we called uh, the police and had that reported. We had another incident because we had two girls and they were playing in the backyard. And they're now, one is now deceased. The other one is 43 years old. She was probably four at the time, something like that. But anyway, uh, they used to play in our backyard, and we had some incident with other kids in the neighborhood that lived behind us that would always call them the N-word and very negative flames. So being the mother that I am, I took care of that. I got in my car and went around there, and, <laughs> and I talked to the mother, and we also called the police to report that. Now, about... Three years ago, I was working the polls and one young lady came up to me and she said, are you Miss Tillman? I said, yes, I am. And she said, would you please tell your daughter, Tori, that I'm sorry? And I said, okay, why are you sorry? Because I did not recognize her. She was one of the young ladies that used to call Tori names and she mm -hmm. said that bothered me for many, many years. And it was her opportunity to let Tori know that she was sorry. She was the youngest of the ones there and she said they were telling her to, to say these things and she said them. Uh, so I, I did tell my daughter Tori that this young lady, and I cannot remember her name, but she was very apologetic about what she had done when they were kids. Okay, those are two very different experiences. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Ms. Atkins, you're on, you're on mute. Trying to help her get off of mute. <laughs> I'm on mute. <laughs> uh, I, so I have, so what are we, what's going on? What's the, what is the question? I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So you could talk to us about some of your, your memories of uh, black businesses or, ch or churches or schools, or you can talk to us about uh, some people that, black people, that we should remember as important parts of uh, Danville's history. Okay, when I moved here it was, well, permanently it was in 74 and not too many black businesses, but I remember the, um, the record shop that was up on the corner of of Main and Second Street. I think that was Mr. Obi that owned that shop and go in there every now and then. And then um, there were a couple, well, of course, a lot of beauticians and barbers uh, here in town. And um, as far as um, places to go and mainly to church was, you know, the place where I went, if you wanted to go out and have a good time, uh, maybe you would be invited to someone's home. We got uh, involved with a couple of, you know, the black couples here in town and some from out of town and some that were from Danville and you'd have a good time like that. If you wanted to go dancing, uh, you know, somebody might have something at the armory or maybe at the Holiday Inn or somewhere like that. Um, 
though, you know, those are the, you know, play cards sometimes, you know, uh, if one of the women's clubs would invite us in to like the Busy Sunshine or someone like that, we would go and uh, get in a card tournament, a, t a tournament like that, uh, maybe WIS or uh, something like, you know, what else, what else did you ask me? <laughs> so, here, so tell me about one of these dances. Tell us a story about these dances you went to. Well, um, the, you know, we just, uh, the music of the time, you know, was like the 60s and 70s music. Um, of course, I went to some da uh, dances later on that had 80s and 90s music. I've, 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 I've had longevity here, but, uh, but you know, everybody just, uh, mostly at, at that time, we, you know, if you did electric slide, that was probably one of the only uh, line dances that we did, but we did uh, mostly, you know, you dance with your partner, those types of things, and um, we, um, you know, you just had fun, and, and, you know, everybody just, you know, just had a good time, you know, we... Who put together these dances? Most of the time, it w it might be a, a group, a, a social group that that would invite you to, to a dance. Um, I know that they have like what, what they call a 60, 68ers, 69ers club or something like that. I don't know, know if they're still active here or not, but they, they will have dances. And then uh, Alonzo McGuire, whatever group he was with, they would have dances at the Armory and we go down there. You know, you did a, a minimal fee and you go in and everybody just had a nice time. Who is Alonzo McGuire? He's uh, a Danville native. Uh, Tillman's, you know exactly, you know what what Alonzo did. I know he had something to do with the armory because we had dances down there. He was he was the one that we could depend on, to always have a good time because he would get something going, uh, like you say, at the armory. Mm -hmm. But in addition to that, there was a group called the the Brotherhood at one point, mm -hmm. and they used to sponsor uh, dances and um, also, like you said, at homes. People would invite people in and we would move the furniture and we would just have a good old time. Mm -hmm. And what was the name of the, um, I'll call it a, a nightclub, if you will, down on Duncan Hill? Ponderosa. Ponderosa. We wasn't allowed in there. <laughs> we, oh, went, I got, we went there I got one caught, time, I it got, was disastrous. <laughs> I got caught in there one night. My, my, my husband um, <laughs> taught school at Bait and um, when Miss Summers and them found out that he took me, you know, we went down there with uh, with some people. We didn't know anything about it. We just was going with, you know, you yeah. know your history before you go. But, exactly. I knew but, it was one way in and one way out. I knew yes. that. <laughs> so we went down there once, one one time, and we we were told, my husband got charted the next day at school because he was a teacher. <laughs> that's why he came here. He was for his job at Bates, so... It didn't. It just didn't rest well with uh, Miss Fry and Miss Bowman and Miss Pryor. You know, uh, they they can't get him kind of cornered and said, "Don't you don't go there." <laughs> so. uh, yeah. Well, a lot of things we didn't know as new yeah. as newcomers at that time. Right. We didn't know where to go and and where not to go. So uh, we did go in one time, but I think I was we didn't stay too long because I didn't I didn't care for the going in and going out the same way. <laughs> right. What do you mean? Uh, just uneasiness, you know, you got to have at least two exits or something, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mrs. Gray, you said you got caught. Yeah, but you just never know. <laughs> Mrs. Gray, you said you got caught in the Ponderosa? Oh, yes. I never will forget that one. I, I had slipped out there because we wasn't allowed, but not go out there. See? <laughs> and the bunch of us went out there. And uh, so somebody looked up and said, oh, Curly, Curly. I said, what? There's your daddy coming in the door. <laughs> <laughs> and they put me under the table. <laughs> he didn't, I think he just come out there just to see if anybody was, uh, of us was out there because he didn't stay. And uh, they put me under the table and, and got in front of the table so he, he couldn't see me. So then when he left, they went out to see that he did leave the, the place, and then we got out of there. Okay. I never go back out there no more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And I know.
If he'd have seen me, I would have got it right there and then in front of everybody. How old were you? I was a teenager. Okay. But I wasn't allowed to go out there. <laughs> Speaking about Mr. McGuire, he was actually a reservist from the Army. And they would have National Guard uh, uh, meetings at the National Guard. And he had access to the building. He, he also, over the years, have sponsored trips, you know, out of town, you know, to, to different historical places and, and things like that, too, so. Have you gone? Yes, we went to uh, New York, New Jersey with, with the, a group one time. And we went to see, uh, was it Color Purple? It yeah. Was a, yeah. Uh, Color Purple, Miss Linda. Yes. Uh -huh. yes, that's what we went to see. He sponsored that, a bus trip. Right. So who is this that sponsored that? Mr. McGuire? McGuire, uh -huh. yes. He was and the contact he, person. He was I don't know it by himself, but he was our contact person. Ah, okay. Ms. Trumbo, are you there? <laughs> Ms. Trumbo? To be there. Um, so you told me about some of the, the, the Ponderosa um, <laughs> and some of the nightclubs. Uh, what about um, the Black Church? Kind of. Wow. How? What role has that played in the in the Black community here, or some of the important churches or or events that have happened at churches? Well, when we first come to town, being from, we're originally from Louisiana, mm -hmm. but we came to Danville by way of several, several places, including Dallas. So we moved from the big Dallas to the little, to the little D. And uh, so we thought that, you know, if you want to get to meet uh, African Americans, the first place to go to is church. So we were in the grocery store one day and I met a lady by the name of Miss Ruby Letcher. She's no longer with us. She just came up to me and she introduced herself and she was the sweetest person and she invited us to church. And uh, so we uh, went to First Baptist and we've been there ever since. Uh, uh, so when we came, Reverend Richard Hill was the pastor. So there were a lot of uh, that Miss Curley can tell you the pastors before Reverend Hill, uh, but uh, all we know is Reverend Hill and now the current pastor. Okay. Yes. Miss Mr. Richardson, are you here? They each went to their hat home to try to help them get on. Okay. Having some trouble. So, Ms. Gray, what role yes. do you think that the church has played in, in the Black community here in Danville? Well, uh, a whole lot. Uh, Reverend Carter was the pastor before Reverend Hill. Now, I remember him. I don't remember the other Reverend Wood. I, 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 I don't remember. He was there, but I don't remember him. Okay. But Reverend Carter, he, he baptized me. And uh, they were right down the, the street, right where <laughs> from the restaurants, where the restaurants was, and on the corner, on the, it's where the, the church is. So a lot of times, you know, you're supposed to be in the church, and you was over there at the restaurant, and you you'd have to they would slip in and out. I I never do that now. I never did, I didn't because I was scared to do that, but they did do it. But uh, Yes, uh, I've always, I've been there, I've joined church there in 1938, and I'm still there. What restaurant was this? What church was this? You said you, you slipped out of the church to go to the restaurant, people would? What restaurant? Yeah, oh yeah, they, they, they would leave and go to, go to the, uh, leave church, it's supposed to be a church, and they'd be over in the restaurants. Okay. A lot of the younger people, but I, I never do that because I knew I'd be I'd get in trouble doing that. But uh, it's it's real. It's they had the BTU and and things like that, 
And I know they had a Christmas play one year. Mm -hmm. And uh, Cleo Letcher, Ruby Letcher's daughter, was behind me. And we was going up and we had these candles. Mm -hmm. And my hair was real long. And <laughs> she caught my hair on fire. <laughs> she just went up the back. And they was putting it out and putting it out. But it didn't hurt. It, it did burn my hair off, though. Oh. But it, 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 it didn't make any difference. <laughs> we laughed it all from went on. Yeah, that will happen. I caught somebody's hair on fire one time in the candlelight service. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, what, it, what, what role do you think the black church has played in Danville? Well, I can remember um, when, like, like uh, the Tillman said, it was a, that you, to know anybody, that's where you went to church. And uh, the church was where... Um, you know, if it, whatever it was, political or, mm -hmm. or, you know, social or that's where, you know, that's where you met people to do those things. Uh, uh, just like, you know, when Dr. King was, you know, was alive and in, um, in segregation and, and the, the fight for, for, um, for equality and all that started back in the 60s. And um, when you went to church, you know, you, the, the leaders, the, 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 the the political leaders were in the church also. And so they would uh, announce, you know, you know, campaigns and things like that through the church. So, you know, it, the church was important to, to just every, just about every aspect of your, you know, of your being, of your life. If you, if you want to get a job, you, you know, it was, a, those things were announced in church, you know, uh, in places that were uh, in church. Oh. Gabe, what's going on? Hey, hey, good morning. Good morning. Yeah, that's Bill. That's Billy. This is this is Billy Richardson. Oh. Okay. Good morning, Ms. Richardson. Can you hear me? Can you hear me okay. All right. So what I'd like to do now is to ask everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Yes, uh-huh. All right. Welcome. Um, what yes, I'd like to do now is ask everybody to think about the Black community in Danville, just whatever comes to your mind when I say Black community of Danville. And to think about over your time here in Danville, how has it changed? What has gotten better? What has gotten worse? What has been gained? What has been lost? Um, what are the first things that come to your mind when I ask this? And I'll start with uh, Mr. Richardson. Uh, I think over the years, uh, things have gotten better. And years ago, I can remember working at my grandfather's barbershop, uh, Shining Shoes, and I met, met a lot of people through the years, and I've seen some of the good and some of the bad, but overall, I think that was a good community. Thank you. Ms. Stallworth, are you with this? Mm -hmm. Not yet. Don't like. Um, Mr. Tillman, what would you say? Well, being from the South, when I first come here, like I say, uh, ex-athlete, uh, the guys would tell me, say, hey, we're going to the projects. And my vision of a project is not like Bakewood Home. Uh, the projects I've seen before, it, it was like no windows, no doors, clothes hanging off uh, lines or whatever. But Bakewood Home at that time <laughs> was a immaculate place to actually reside. It was well maintained and on, uh, I guess, uh, activity center, and it was very well controlled. And really, if you stayed in Bakewood Home and too long as a visitor, 
people want to know why you were down there. So <laughs> I raised our two daughters, and, and we're just blessed to be here today. Gray, how do you think the black community in Danville has changed? Has it gotten better, gotten worse? Has anything been lost? Well, I think it's it's better, but um, I've always done just about the same thing and I do now. I did all my life, really. And uh, I know we, we had this uh, club, this Arctic Girls Club, and uh, we had dances and parties and we went to we go on trips. We went to New York's World Fair and just did everything. And uh we I, we just always did did what we wanted to do. What the what was the name of that club? The Arctic Girls. The Arctic Girls, okay. Yeah. What what was the purpose of that club? It was just a social club. Mm hmm We would uh meet in, in, in our homes and we would have dinner. I mean, we would have dinner. Okay. <coughs> and uh, we used the uh, best china and everything. And everything we did it was really top. Oh, nice. About how many um, women, young girls were in that club? They We were women. Women, okay. And it was... Um, it was about 12, 13 or 14, it would always be that many. We'd always pick who we wanted. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd always have enough so we could have three tables to play cards. we play quiz. <laughs> and you had, we had our dinner and everything. And then we'd have dances. And we'd have, uh, as I say, we'd go on trips and take people with us. And if we went to New York World Fair, and I bought my husband, this is the truth, I bought my husband three cans of beer back from the World New York World Fair. He drank two of them. You know how long that's been? I have still got one can of that beer in my refrigerator. Huh. Nobody's never oh touched it. It's so there. <laughs> James knows that I'm, what I'm talking about. That's probably worth a lot of money. It probably is, but it's not, no, it's there, and nobody bothers it. And I bought it from the World Fair in New York, and that's been years and years and years ago. Wow. James, I'm, I'm, I'm going to show you that can of beer. Next time you come down, make a special trip and come and see it. <laughs> hey, Andrea. Yeah. Uh, that's the way, you know... That's the way they got together then. They had like the Busy Sunshine Club. They had Domestic Economy Club. They had what they called Kentucky what, Club. What did you say? Yeah, they had, you know, and that's the way they, you know, you couldn't go to where other races went. So they they, they kind of, that's what they did, how they got together and had fun. Uh, and 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 they and they would do little, sponsor little things like uh, 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 um, say, um, like Linda said, the Brotherhood Club that they sponsored the, a beauty contest for the girls. Oh, where'd she go? Oh man! All right. Well, Arlie's trying to get back on. Those are good. Um, so, thinking about these the these clubs, um, the Orchid Club, the Kentucky Clubs, the um, the the Ponderosa, the Black Church back in the day. The, um, how do you think, well, we were, we were already talking about how it, you, you think overall that it's, uh, how much do you miss those things? I guess is what I'm asking. Do you wish those things still existed, those kind of clubs? Yes. Okay. Yes. I mm -hmm. think they need it. <laughs> I think it's, it, it, it would help the community for them to go out and think that people nowadays just for themselves. They don't think about other people. 
that they, they don't do like they used to do. It's just it's just a whole different attitude. I don't know what it is with the young people now. Thank you. I don't know where if it's just selfish or stuff. What I don't know what it is, but it's uh, Andrew. It's they need one thing they like not that. mentioned, they got history alive. And Mm -hmm. They kept black history alive in this community because they uh, allowed Bobby Trumbull, myself, and other people who were uh, instructors, uh, teachers, to come to their meetings and teach things about black history and about uh, proper etiquette and debutante balls and scholarship <laughs> monies and all kind of things that these social clubs did. You want to talk a little bit more about that, J.H.? Yeah, can you hear me? I can hear you. Um, uh, the, Kentucky Club, the Kentucky Club, for example, they traveled mm -hmm. uh, to Detroit and Chicago, different cities mm -hmm. and states mm -hmm. where these citizens from Danville had left Kentucky and moved to those places. And so when they went to those places, it was a weekend gathering, but it was educational stuff. It was money for scholarships. They came to Danville once every four years and put on a weekend program, and so the folks who lived out of state came home and they had guest speakers and they had workshops. Of course, they had the food and the party stuff. Uh, they took tours of historical Black Danville and uh, uh, they just did a lot of real good educational things that as a newcomer to Danville, uh, I think I got invited, Artie and I, because uh, they want to know who these uh, Black guys were from uh, Lexington because uh, I got introduced as being from the the Lexington Mafia by my boss. <laughs> and so that was intriguing to people that you had this black guy from the Mafia in Lexington come to be able to teach middle school kids. And so it was a joking type of thing, but it just really gave me a chance to see and meet lots and lots and lots of people outside the church. You know, I always could find people in the church, but these clubs provided a great way to come in and to give young folks real good, solid education. So, the hand, uh, Artie, did you want to finish what you were saying? Oh, I was explaining about that. The things that, that have changed may, mainly is, you know, when we first came here, there were, there were distinct black neighborhoods. And now, you know, people mm -hmm. have kind of ventured out and uh, some of the whites have come in, you know, to neighborhoods that were traditionally black and vice versa. You know, it's, that's, that would be some of what I've seen that's changed. Uh, the neighborhoods. So we're approaching 11 o'clock. So what I would like to do now is um, you, you've talked about the, the clubs and the churches and, the, and your memories. And you kind of touched a little bit on how Mrs. Gray and, and J.H. and Arnie, you've talked about how things, um, how you miss some of these things. So for everybody, this is the, the question. If you had the power, money wasn't the issue, politics wasn't the issue, but you had the power to, um, to and all the resources you need, what would you like to see happen in and for the Black community of Danville? What does the best version of Black Danville look like to you? I'll start with Artie on that one. <laughs> oh, I, I just like, I, I love diversity. You know, I like um, just everyone getting along, um, black, brown, white, just, you know, just all people, you know, <laughs> integrating together, you know, mixing together and just getting along and, um, the atmosphere of today is almost like it was back in the 50s, you know, where we, we, we were, you know, kind of fighting each other. And, and uh, so I would just love to have harmony, you know, with among people like God would want it to be, <laughs> to, to make, you know, to make it short and sweet. I just would love for everyone to get along. Amen. Mr. Tillman? I kind of agree with what Ms. Artie just stated, which would be the diversity, the equity, and the inclusion, uh, mm -hmm. with the harmony among all people. 
Okay. So can you, what would that look like? What would you, what would you like to see happening? It, it's going to require, I guess, some education, educating all of us so that we can actually buy into the DEI, including city officials, and all. It's got to start from the top. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Richardson. Are you there? Miss Miss Trumbo. Okay. Miss Stallworth. Daniel got it done. Mrs. Gray, what does the best Danville look like to you, Black Danville look like to you? I just wish that everybody would just be happy and get along together and black, white, blue, green, whatever. Mm -hmm. And just stop all of this. It's just so much evilness and killing and things and killing each other and just but everything just to, 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 to just stop all this cruelness, meanness. It's just, just meanness. All right. Thank you. Is there anything that anybody would like to say that they haven't gotten a chance to say? Well, in that case, um, I thank everybody for sticking with us through our technical difficulties. Um, and, and, um, and really appreciate, these are some really good stories. I didn't know about, I heard about the Ponderosa, but I know all these stories about the Ponderosa <laughs> and, and the Orchid Club. And I really, I really appreciate, I think the artists have some good material to work with now. And um, I'm gonna uh, turn it back over to Nikki and if you want to say something. Again, thank you so much for your time today and sharing your stories with us. We're listening and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll be in touch with you and we hope you all have a really good rest of your Saturday. And thank you so, so much. This was really great getting to talk to you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.